Welcome to Talking Markets. We're joined today by News Squawk Senior Market Analyst, Adam Linton. Adam's going to be giving us his insights on a variety of topics today. We'll be exploring upcoming central bank interest rate decisions, including the US, ECB and Japan, as well as looking at longer term at potential stagflation in the UK, how to assess risks in the US stock market, and how you can prepare for tier one macro events and rate decisions. Uh, so obviously we've got the FOMC meeting later this week. Uh, yeah. What are your expectations for the meeting? So in terms of kind of what I'm looking out for, I think it's worth just working our way back to May, kind of what we saw in the aftermath of the May meeting, where as expected, we saw the Fed deliver a 25 basis point rate hike. The key takeaway from that meeting was very much the addition or the removal rather of some of their prior language about additional policy firming. So in the aftermath of that meeting, we saw an unchanged rate for June, that's priced at 100%. And we saw 75 basis points worth of loosening for the year end. If you kind of fast forward then in terms of how things have kind of played out, inflation data, yes, it has continued to slow, but at a slightly slower pace than it has been previously. We've also seen some kind of mixed messages within the labour market. So for the non-farm payrolls, as everyone saw, that was a blowout number for the headline, which is derived from the establishment survey. Whereas in contrast to that, we saw an increase in the unemployment rate from 3.4% to three spot seven percent and that's taken from the household survey if you take the associated employment change number from within that release that would be negative three hundred thousand so there's a six hundred thousand swing there so it's like conflicting signals in the labor market and if you take kind of other data points such as your jolts data the february and march reports they were kind of going towards the fed's favor then we saw an uptick in april and then when you take other things like the PMIs, they've been given slightly conflicting signals from a growth perspective. Even the PMIs can't agree with each other. You have the ISM report, which is relatively bearish on the economy. The S&P Global one is slightly more bullish on the economy. And then, yes, we saw that spike high in the weekly jobless claims last week. It went above 260,000. But it's quite an erratic data series. You get some quite bits of volatility. You often get revisions and some one-off factors which kind of bolster things. So all in all things, there's a little bit of like indecision as to exactly where the US economy is. And that's kind of leading up to expectations of the June meeting, which is best just to pause or as the language says now, skip that one. And so that would be kind of the main takeaway of the meeting on the day. Yes, we have CPI the day before the release. If it's particularly out of line, we could potentially see a move. I think it's relatively unlikely as we've got the Fed in blackout period. They'd probably rather just wait for July, see other evidence in the US economy and see how things kind of unfold on that form. At the June meeting, we also have the dot plots. That's the Fed's summary of economic projections. So as always, we'll be looking out for are there any revisions to the rate path. If there are, we could potentially see an increase to the dot, which is just the Fed isn't necessarily done yet. But you know, that's not necessarily the base case. It's just a market risk that people need to be aware of. In terms of things I'm looking out for, I think one of the greatest sources of interest will actually be the 2024 plot, because that will show the pace at which the Fed anticipates cutting rates. And I think that could be one of the key drivers of the market on the day. And then after that, we get the press conference from Powell, I'm sure all the financial journalists are going to be trying to get their headline and nail them down to whether they move again in July or not. And then if they do, how does Fed Powell's, you know, assess the risk rounds in the regional banking sector? Looking forward to kind of July and September, how do you see the kind of the, the meetings going then? And, you know, if they do pause, what are your thoughts on July and September? Yeah, the easy answer is you need to wait for the data. That's what Fed officials do. That's what we should all be doing. Okay. But, you know, in terms of market pricing, and the market is looking for a hike in July, which I think could be a reasonable bet. I think one of the most interesting market developments we've seen recently is actually been from the Bank of Canada and RBA. So, you know, they might not filter directly into the Fed's thinking, but from a market sentiment standpoint, it's given the market kind of a playbook of two major developed central banks, which throughout the year have paused at some point, have come back to the table with further rate hikes. So what this kind of means from a market's perspective is, there's a lot less certainty now over whether when the Fed will reach terminal. Even if they go in July, it may not necessarily be a case that, yes, we've reached terminal. So there's a lot of uncertainty about where that peak rate is. And also that then filters through into expectations when we eventually get rate cuts. So, yeah, so basically watch the data. That's the Fed meeting. We've also got the ECB that are going to be announcing later this week as well. What are your, what are your expectations for that meeting? So I think this is quite, an, this is actually quite another straightforward one. So if you go, go back to May, we saw them hike by 25 basis points. So they stepped down from 50 to 25. The need to hike rates, that was predicated on the fact that inflation is still too high for too long. And that's a direct copy and paste in their statement. The reason why we stepped down from 50 to 25 and changed like the cadence of the rate hikes was actually 
uncertainty about the monetary transmission. They've done some tightening already. There's a lot of uncertainty as to how that'll filter through into the Eurozone economy. So best just to take a little bit more of a cautious approach. In terms of kind of how the data has played out, yes, we've seen quite a lot of slowing in the inflation data. It's a headline CPI. That's now slowed to 6.1% from 7%. The Supercore reading, that's now at 5.3% down from 56 And Supercore is basically, this inflation risk strips up something more volatile components such as food and energy, et cetera. Then also recently saw the ECB's survey of consumer expectations. We saw a calling for the one year and the three year. So yes, things are heading in the right direction for the ECB, but let's not forget they were late to the party when it came to this thing. They've still got more ground to cover. And yeah, so I think it'll be a relatively straightforward one. Hike 25 in June, see how the data plays out and we assess in July. And so going forward then, um, you know, all, all things being well and inflation does come down, how do you see the kind of July, September meetings going? Yep, so after a 25 base point hike in June, I think we'll get another 25 in July. That's where the market's pricing. I think September is just too, is too difficult to call at this stage. I mean, there's a lot of data to play out in between now and then. The ECB's forecasting doesn't have a great track record. <laughs> at the June meeting, we'll see them present their staff economic projections, whereby the short-term ones, in my opinion, they should be dismissed. They're not particularly accurate. But from a sentiment perspective, those longer ones over the kind of medium terms at the 2025s, they're important because they show where the ECB sees inflation relative to their target. So if inflation, for example, is materially above their target, it's indicative that further tightening is to come. In terms of kind of how things develop there, I think a lot remains to be seen. I think one thing traders really need to be wary of, and this is from experience, in the aftermath of the meeting, you'll likely see source reporting. And basically source reporting is where someone on the governing council or the bank will ring up a major news outlet and they'll either try and mend kind of the takeaway from the meeting or trying to put their case forward for what's going to happen later on. And we've seen in recent weeks, we've seen some members of the ECB suggest that September, they're looking to hike in September, but the markets basically dismissed this and rightfully so. We don't know who the source are. We don't know what yeah. faction of the ECB they represent. And we've seen the ECB throughout the cycle struggle to kind of forecast from meeting to meeting. So September, you know, three months away. Good luck to them if they think they've got a solid call for that meeting. Yeah. I mean, where do you see the kind of terminal rate being for the ECB? Um, so I think I think we've got another 50 basis points worth of tightening in us. I think about 25 in June, 25 in July. I think, you know, the ECB's nerve for kind of further tightening is relatively limited. You've got to remember the ECB, it's a multinational block. So the decision to hike rates isn't necessarily always an economic one, it's a political one as well. So for some of the more peripheral nations, they may try to, try to bargain and get a lower terminal rate. But what you may then see, and this is something traders need to be mindful of, is do you get a more aggressive wind down of the balance sheet, which could potentially be a victory for the Hawks. And that'd always feel like a classic Lagarde kind of compromise between the two factions. Comparing the kind of ECB to, to the Fed, do you see the ECB saying hi for longer? Or will, will they just follow what the Fed does? I think we've already kind of seen this cycle, the ECB that hasn't necessarily followed the Fed because the ECB, they were quite late to the party. I think, you know, if you take something like energy, there's a very different energy backdrop and mix in the Eurozone compared to the US. I think, you know, Eurozone is going to have to be guided just by the data and their internals. If you're a central bank, your main currency is your credibility. You can't necessarily just be in a case of just following what the Fed does. They need to see the data and fulfill their mandate. Before we continue, a reminder that here at Capital.com, we make explainer videos about trading and economics, giving you insights on the markets so you can make informed trading decisions. We're also a trading platform, so you can make your trades right here on our website or using our app. Uh, so moving on to Bank of Japan now. Yeah. Uh, they've obviously got their meeting later on this week. Uh, do you see anything kind of unexpected coming from that meeting? Okay, so the short answer is no. So if you kind of look at the policy journey the Bank of Japan has been on, if we work our way back to December 2022, which for me feels like a lifetime ago, yeah. but we saw those initial first tweaks, didn't we, to the uh, uh, BOJ's yield curve control program. Yeah. So they increased the upper limit. And then people thought, okay, is this the start of policy normalization for the Bank of Japan? And in terms of the way they'd go about it, it's slightly different to other central banks. So basically they would possibly make another tweak, increase the upper limit or work their way back down the Japanese yield curve. Then there's exit yield curve control and then they'd eventually start hiking rates. Well, Kuroda left the bank in April and he's been replaced by Ueda. 
And in terms of recent data, you know, the mandate of the BOJ is inflation stayed around 2% with sustained wage growth. The April wage data was a little bit of a dud, to be honest. It wasn't really in fit with what they're hoping for. And therefore, you've kind of seen from UADA they need to carry on with extraordinary monetary stimulus. So it isn't necessarily going to be one for fireworks. And if there was something kind of unexpected, if they did decide to kind of go back on their ultra-loose monetary policy, what, what, how do you think the markets would react? Surprised, for starters. But uh, yeah, I think you definitely see some yen appreciation. But I think, you know, even though this meeting itself isn't necessarily interesting, the fact that it isn't interesting could be one of the key drivers for FX markets. So if you go back to that December meeting, we saw notable downside in dollar yen. We saw the yen I appreciate because people thought we we're going to get a tight monetary policy from the BOJ. Yeah. So we went back below kind of like 130. And then in recent weeks, we've seen a reappraisal of that. We've been back above 140 because the trade here for markets is, is, is policy divergence. We've got increasingly hawkish Fed. We've got the BOJ still remaining dovish. So if the BOJ does continue to remain dovish for longer, the Feds, they may be sneaking a hike in July, then do we kind of get up towards about possibly those 150 levels that we saw a few months ago. And if we do get towards that, then the one thing traders really need to be careful for is, you know, it depends on the velocity of the moves. Japanese authorities have a limited appetite for these. So they could potentially intervene in the market. I'm personally um, cynical as to how much of a sustained move that would have in the market, but it can be a real source of volatility and something that all traders need to be aware of from an intraday basis as some of the moves can whip around quite a lot. Moving on to kind of China now, obviously massive economy. Uh, what yeah. the, the data that's coming out there at the moment? They've they've not had the kind of expected growth that they wanted. Uh, what what are your thoughts on China and how that affect the markets? Yeah, so you know China's China's an interesting one um, in terms of recent data. It's been relatively disappointing, as you correctly mentioned. The inflation data has been soft. The PMI has been disappointing. The trade figures got a lot of attention last week, particularly those exports ones. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people may not trade Chinese assets directly, but as you correctly said, in terms of like the global economy, it's incredibly systemic. And, you know, running a European desk, my kind of focus is actually on the euro. So if you look at price action for euro dollar this year, part of the feel good story, which took us from like, like the 105 era to 110, yes, in part was softer energy prices. So, there's a lot of expectations that we just kind of, you know, have a pretty tough winter in the Eurozone. I didn't necessarily kind of transpire, but another part of that equation was also the China reopening story. And that's been something which has been particularly supportive for Euro. Eurozone actually has a higher economic exposure to China than it does the US. And that's kind of been a big driving force for Euro dollar. So then all of a sudden, if China does falter, we get a hawkish Fed. And if you think the ECB is priced to perfection in terms of hawkishness, yeah. which I think is a fair argument that you can make, then do we potentially get a revisit of those kind of 105 levels of downside? And if we breach that, then I'm sure all the financial media are going to be calling for parity before you know it. Uh, so obviously we've got the war ongoing in, uh, in Ukraine. And when that fund kind of first started, there was quite a lot of volatility in the markets. Uh, is this a kind of thematic issue or do you just see it as a lot of kind of media noise and how relevant is it to the, to the markets? Yeah, no, that's definitely, I think that's a fair question. So if you kind of work our way back to 2022, obviously when the initial invasion happened, it caught a lot of people by surprise the market. So initially it was kind of seen as like a risk off event. When that kind of like subsided, it then filtered through into what was viewed as a pro-inflationary shock, which of course it was. We saw higher energy prices, we've seen higher food prices. And that's still something we're contending with to this day. In terms of all kind of recent weeks, we've seen an increased media attention. So Ukraine started its counteroffensive. We saw the dam explosion last week. And, you know, running kind of like a news desk and a financial markets desk, you're kind of having to process all these things on a daily basis. And yes, there is a lot of noise. But for me, you know, my kind of advice to people would be try and filter out that noise and think about what is the direct market impact. Yes, we had a pro-inflationary shock, but since then, We've seen a lot of European nations diversify energy supplies away from Russia and Ukraine. Unless there is like a material escalation, I think attention will probably be elsewhere. I think it'll be on things like the FMC, the ECB, what's going to happen in China. You know, if you do get an escalation, of course, if you do see, for example, a suspension of the Black Sea grain deal, then obviously ags markets could be particularly focused. And if food prices go higher, then yes, of course, that could make things more difficult for central bankers. But at this, at this moment in time, I don't necessarily see it as one of like the key thematic issues, which is absolutely top of my list. 
So let's dive straight into the Bank of England. Uh, do you think they've got monetary policy under control at the moment? And how do you see things kind of playing out over the next couple of meetings? So under control, the short answer is probably no. I mean, we're 670 basis points above target when it comes to year-over-year -year inflation in the UK. If you kind of consider the policy journey the Bank of England has been on so far, yeah. their first rate hike, that was in December 2021. And we've had 435 basis points worth of tightening since then, and not a great deal to show for it. In the interest of fairness to the bank, you mean two of the big inflationary shocks have been exogenous to them. So basically, we saw the lingering effects of the pandemic, which created distortions within supply chains that led, led, led into increased manufacturing input costs. And then that's kind of took us through into February 2022, where, of course, we saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, once again, was another pro-inflationary shock. We saw higher energy prices. We saw higher food prices. So there hasn't really been a great deal that the Bank of England's really been able to do for that. The problem is, in the way that inflation works, is it filters through into other sectors. So those higher energy costs, those higher food costs, it means, for example, if you go out to eat at a restaurant, they're dealing with higher input costs. They're going to pass that on to the consumer. And the problem for the Bank of England is, unless they're enabled, enabled to break that demand side of the equation, then, you know, this gets almost self-fulfilling because all of a sudden people that ask for higher wages yeah. and then, you know, your macroeconomics textbook tells you that if you have an increased money supply chase and a fixed amount of goods, you get further inflation, you get caught in basically kind of this doom loop. If you're going to take more recent events, the April inflation data, that was a shocker. It's not what the Bank of England wants to see. Yes, it fell, but not nearly by as much as they wanted it to. And that's why for the upcoming meeting in June, 25 basis points is nailed on. In terms of for the rest of the year, there's 100 basis points with the Titan and priced in. For me personally, I think it looks a little bit too aggressive. I think we'll get 25 in June and probably 25 in August. The reason why I kind of disagree with the market is if you actually listen to what the central bankers are saying, such as Governor Bailey, Chief Economist Pill, they keep talking up this notion there's a lot of tightening in the pipeline. So basically what that means is there's a monetary transmission lag. Basically, if you hike rates, there's no like immediate effect. Yeah. Typically, before like, the pandemic, it was seen as somewhere about 18-ish months. Some people have suggested it could be around about 12 months. But either way, there's a lot of tightening in the pipeline, and that will continue to filter its way through into the economy. So I think they'll be a little bit reticent, and I think they'll be kind of hoping that some of the year-over-year -year base effects from last year when it comes to inflation will kind of filter through and just begin to drag inflation more materially lower than it has been. And how do you kind of see the future of the, of the pound? Where are we kind of heading? And is there kind of worries that we could go into a stagflation re-environment? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a fair question. I mean, what I've kind of said so far for the Bank of England, it all sounds relatively negative, but we know it's actually been a pretty good year for the pound so far, hasn't it? So it's been one of the best performers in the G10 FX space. And it's not necessarily a story of positivity as to how we've got here. It's more a case of things are less bad than feared. I mean, remember that November... Uh, monetary policy report from the Bank of England. They're forecasting five consecutive quarters of recession. Well, so far we haven't entered into recession. So therefore we've kind of seen it unwind to some of that negativity, which when you kind of align that with some of the softness we saw in the dollar, it's seen the pound against the dollar or cables, people the markets call it, that's kind of moved back above 125 to the upside. The problem for the pound here is if the Bank of England keeps hiking rates, what pressure does that put on the UK economy? And this is, you know, like I was saying, the reticence of some of the officials on the Monetary Policy Committee, yeah. why they kind of get a little bit more nervous here. And one you know, sector where that would be particularly evident will be the housing sector, okay? So a lot of people, they're going to have to be refinancing their mortgages and they have to be refinancing them at higher rates. And I think I read the other day, is each quarter for the rest of the year, 7% of the total stock of these mortgages would need to be refinanced. And this is going to be something which plays out through into 2024. So in terms of UK consumers' household incomes, this isn't a good thing. Yes, there may be some relief on the energy front, so the off-gen price cap, that should move lower throughout the rest of the year. But, you know, the growth perspective, the feel good, well, feel good, but less bad than expected start of the year, I think that could really begin to wane at some point. And also, if you think about the good run that cables has, and if you're constructive on the dollar, then I think you could argue it could potentially look a little bit vulnerable at these levels. And what are your kind of thoughts for the kind of term on a rate for the Bank of England? Are this, is, will it be similar to the ECB? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I think I think we get another 50 basis points from the Bank of England. But the Bank of England, they were actually one of the more proactive central banks. So they got us hiking in 2021. Yeah. It took the ECB until the summer of 2022. I think there'll be a higher terminal rate for the Bank of England compared to the ECB. But sometimes it's almost a case of comparing apples and oranges. 
the inflation mix in the UK is different to the Eurozone yeah. and things like the housing sector, people's exposure to mortgage rates are different. So I don't necessarily be comparing necessarily kind of where the actual peak level is. I think it's more a case of kind of when do they stop? Is there any interest differential plays? Does that make its way through Euro Sterling? Personally, I think Euro Sterling doesn't necessarily tend to do a great deal over the longer term. I think if you kind of want to co compare and contrast, I think possibly the Fed to the Bank of England yeah. with the Feds, yes, they may hike more, but I think they've got potentially a slightly stronger growth outlook and backdrop than the UK does. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of brings us nicely on to the next topic, which is the US stock market. You know, we've seen the S&P 500 approaching kind of record highs. Uh, there's still plenty of headwinds. Uh, you've still got inflation, you've still got high rates. Um, what, is the, what are the kind of main risk assessments for the US stock market at the moment? Yeah, so I think, you know, you really need to kind of look into kind of how we've got to where we've got to at the moment. OK, so, yes, we've seen this tremendous road in S&P 500 since that October low. And in terms of the driver of it, it's, you know, the big five, it's Microsoft, NVIDIA, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet. OK, so those companies, they account for 24 percent of the S&P 500. OK, it is market. Uh, cap weighted index as opposed to a price cap one and they account for around 75 percent of the gains okay the s p 500 is up over 11 percent this year if you ship those companies out it's actually negative okay so yes ai has been incredibly thematic throughout the year and we've seen nvidia across the one trillion dollar market cap and for them yes obviously they're a chip producer yes it's a huge thing but i think that in terms of what's actually driving the broader tape i think there's actually more kind of going on here i think it's actually kind of a bit more technical in nature so if you kind of work your way back to August last year and as we're heading through into 2023, we saw a lot of portfolio managers kind of reassess their kind of outlook for some of these large cap names. They actually began to go underweight them. There were a, bit, a lot of questions over kind of, you know, how would they deal with a rising rate environment? Yeah, you know, they benefited during COVID when we're at the zero lower bound. But, you know, this new kind of paradigm they're entering into, a lot of people are cynical about, you know, are these companies potentially overvalued? So we saw them go underweight and into 2023. But then, you know, in March, we saw the U.S. banking crisis. We saw a bit of a reappraisal of some of those bets. And some people actually said there was more of a fight to quality into these names. And, you know, if you look at a bulk of the S&P 500's gains year to date, it actually took place between that mid-March and that mid-April kind of time frame. Yeah. And if you ally that with kind of, for example, earnings season, so we've gone through earnings season relatively unscathed, the amount of EPS beats we saw were above the five-year average. So all in all, things have looked relatively healthy in that kind of standpoint. It's kind of got to where we are kind of now. And uh, so give me some of the kind of positives, negatives, uh, in your opinion, on the, on the US stock market at the moment. And we'll start with the positives. So what's looking good for the US stock market? So, you know, in terms of a sentiment perspective, and I'm sure some people will be kind of screaming at their TVs about this, but, <laughs> you know, we've seen it all over the place. We are now in a bull market. So since that October low, yes, it's only kind of like a man-made construct. It's not, you know... It's not like a naturally occurring thing, but you could potentially see a further capitulation of shorts. Do we go and get some of these FOMO trades? People are like, okay, we're in a bull market now. Does that kind of like help lift sentiments further? It could potentially do that. We've kind of broken this month of month trends of kind of negative returns to the stock market. Yeah. So it was 12 consecutive months. And I was reading some research the other day that a year after that's happened, every time that failed, the stock market's been up a year after. Yeah. The gains, they range from about two to kind of like 38%, but is a potentially a positive factor for the market to be aware of. I think also you've got volatility low. At the moment, we saw the VIX that dips below, I think about 14 the other day, to suddenly lows from Feb 2020. That's potentially a positive for the stock market. Like I said, earnings season, we got through it relatively unscathed. It shows, you know, that corporate America is still doing relatively well, all things considered. I think if we see, you know, things like if we look at the survey data, we've seen declining input costs for manufacturers. If that does kind of you know, continue to pick up, does that relieve, alleviate some like the margin pressure on some of these manufacturing companies? And then also, you know, let's not forget the Fed as well. Yes, we are priced for potentially another further rate hike. If the inflation you know, does continue to pull back further, I don't think we'll necessarily get rate cuts this year, but it could potentially dispel some of those expectations that the Fed could move higher and we could potentially cement expectations for where terminal lies. That's kind of like the positives. And the negatives. The <laughs> negatives. Okay, so, you know, I mean, the question at the moment is, are large cap tech stocks overvalued, okay? We've seen this huge run. Like I said, NVIDIA, that went above the $1 trillion mark. 
I think, you know, if you do continue to kind of climb further, I think it's going to be further questions over whether that is, you know, is it time to potentially book to profits on some of these trades? Yeah. And that also kind of plays into the theme of kind of market breadth. So when I say market breadth, basically S&P 500 has 500 companies. We're only seeing kind of gains for some of these like large cap names. Yeah. If the index is to kind of go high, if to sustain this move, do we need kind of greater participation from some of these other companies? If they're kind of still in the doldrums, how much further can S&P 500 actually go? And then in the slightly more kind of technical nature, we've kind of seen this in recent sessions. If people are to start buying kind of some of these smaller cap companies, is this part of kind of like a rotation play? So kind of what I mean by this is, do people start selling these large cap tech names and then do they start buying, for example, energy? Do they start buying financial names? Yes, that'll be positive for those stocks. And if you have them in an ETF, that'll be positive for that sector. But like I said, it's a market cap weighted index. You're selling the biggest companies and buying some of the smaller ones on a headline basis, the S&P 500, that would be negative. Yeah. If you take the NASDAQ, which has an even greater concentration of these names, it will be even more negative. And therefore you could see if, you know, a bid into something like the Russell 2000 that could actually benefit, which is exactly what we've kind of seen in some of the recent trading sessions. And then in terms of other things that kind of on my radar, if the Fed hikes again, do we kind of get a revisit of some of the regional banking fears that we saw early in the year in March? That could be something to contend with. Do we get another credit event? And then elsewhere, we saw the resolution of debt ceiling. We're all very happy about that. We can stop talking about it. But <laughs> the main consequence of that is the Treasury needs to refill its coffers. And therefore, it needs to issue a lot of Treasury bills. That drains liquidity out of the market, yeah. uh, which is potentially a potential headwind. If you get banking fears, liquidity drain, it doesn't necessarily seem like a healthy backdrop to me kind of for the economic outlook. So, yeah, those are kind of some of the things that are kind of on my radar at the moment. So, Adam, tell me a little bit about New Scork uh, and what you do there, what you guys do. Yeah, so I run the European desk over at New Scork. So we are a Scork feed, as the name suggests, which for those of you not aware, it's basically it's a live audio feed we deliver for traders. Correct. And on that, we cover a variety of things. We cover kind of breaking market news, ongoing market moves. We prep you for tier one events. And basically, we are eyes and ears on the market throughout the trading session. We supplement that with a headline feed so you can kind of keep everything documented that's happening throughout the day. And we also have a research portal full of daily briefings. So basically, when you get in the office the next day or you fire up your laptop or whatever, you know exactly everything that's happened since you left your desk. So basically, we're here to make markets and understand markets more convenient for you. You just mentioned tier one events there. So, I mean, how does a trader kind of prepare for those tier one events? Those rate, big rate rises, big Fed rate rises, the kind of macro macro events, how does a trader prepare, prepare for those? Yeah, so I mean, I'm not a trader myself, I'm an analyst, but I think there's a lot of carryover from what I do compared to what a trader does. Yeah. Like I said, I work in a live environment, you know, a lot of analysts, they get to kind of see the event, digest it, and they'll write, you know, 500 words a copy or a research report after. That's kind of not the sector that this community I'm in. I'm very much kind of dealing with things as and when they happen. So therefore, you know, when I sit down on the score, which is the microphone, I basically, if I'm covering a tier one event, I need to have a really good handle on everything that's kind of happened up until that point yeah. and basically be able to kind of explain to clients the things they need to look out for. So if you kind of want to work away through an example, if you take a central bank meeting, so if I was to sit down and I was going to score the ECB, for example, I've been doing this for 10 years. There's no way in a million years or my boss would let me sit down and just score it, okay? It's all about the preparation. So for example, something that I would look at I would, for starters, I'd go back to the prior meeting, maybe even two, one, two before that. And I'd try to figure out the policy evolution as to how we've kind of got here. Yeah. So I look at what's kind of happened at the prior meeting, what the guidance from central bank officials have been since, and I kind of give them the context I need. I'll then look at the data, see how that's kind of played out, what's inflation done, growth, unemployment, and kind of how's that aligned with what, you know, we expect in the prior meeting, what we've been guided towards. And then more importantly, I'll then see what the central bank officials have said, because it's ultimately, it's them for them to frame the data, they, they make the decisions, how they kind of interpret it. And then, you know, you need to get quite granular to an extent. If it's something like the ECB, you have very hawkish members, you have very dervish members, some have a greater voice, some don't. And that's something at New School we try to kind of convey to our clients and try to help them out with. Yeah. And then kind of want, when that's kind of all in place, you've kind of got, you know, the context that you need. It's very important to understand where the consensus and where the market pricing lies. So, for example, consensus, what I mean by that, it's a survey of analyst expectations. And basically, the reason why that's important is because you'll see on your, your calendar, for example, 
ECB expected to hike rates by 25 basis points, okay? Yeah. Well, if you look at the actual breakdown of the survey, this is something that we focus on quite a lot, you may see that the median expectation is for the ECB to hike rates by 25 basis points. But there's actually quite a few people who are expecting 50 basis points. So if the ECB hikes by 25 basis points, all things equal, typically, you'd expect that to be bullish for the euro. However, though, there's a world in which that may not necessarily be the case because these 50 basis point bets, they'll be disappointed and therefore you could potentially get an adverse reaction for the currency. So I need to know all of that. I then also need to know market pricing. So market pricing is basically how financial instruments are priced for a certain event. Yeah. And, you know, the reason why I kind of look at this, I look at this more for like kind of like the, the meetings beyond the current one because market pricing extends into the future. So you may have a case where, for example, an upcoming meeting it's fully priced, whereby, you know, the ECB expected to hike rates by 25 basis points. But you then may look at, ahead to the next meeting, where it's actually a bit of a coin flip as to whether they're going to hike again or not. So therefore, the main takeaway on the day may be, yes, they may hike, but what's the guidance towards this meeting? And on the day, the market reaction may be from that rather than kind of the initial policy announcement. Yeah, so that's kind of like the framework that I have. It's also important not to get tunnel vision. I've been on the score plenty of times before where... I've been kind of squawking things. I'm saying this is really hawkish. This is hawkish. I look up at my charts and the market's going against me. So you need kind of that. Yeah. It needs to be humble and kind of recognize when the market's going against you and kind of readjust your focus accordingly. I mean, how do you, uh, as, you know, how do you tell whether something's priced in, as you say? Is it kind of, it's quite a difficult thing to judge, I imagine. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this is derived from financial market instruments. Um, so, you know, you'll look at different parts of like the curve. And there's different services which do that. Over at New School, we can kind of help help you with that, see where it is. And I talk to market contacts. I kind of look at price action within the market. Uh, like one way, one example could be ECB speakers at the moment. They've been talking relatively hawkishly, hasn't been moving the market. And that's kind of a sign that, you know, we kind of price as hawkishly as we can be. Yeah. And then con like contrary to that, if you saw someone say something a bit more dovish and the market starts moving when they're talking dovish, you know, we kind of price hawkishly and there's room for kind of repricing to the dervish side. And so if they're, that's quite interesting actually. So if, if they're kind of giving dervish rhetoric, for example, uh, and then there's a surprising kind of hawkish uh, turn on the actual meeting, could you see quite a lot of volatility then in the markets? Yeah, definitely. It al always depends on who is being dervish, for example. So if it's someone who's typically of a dervish nature, they're saying dervish, that's kind of in fitting with what you'd expect them to say. But if you have someone, for example, at the ECB, if a, a German representative was being dovish, then that would be potentially something. They'd be trying to guide the market towards that kind of outcome. That's how you take it. And therefore, if that's not obviously realised at the meeting, then yes, you'd probably like to see some volatility on that event. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Adam. Uh, some brilliant insights there, and we'd love to have you on again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.